Hey everyone, I'm Adam Harrington, and today I'm exploring the land here in Western Pennsylvania in search of one mushroom in particular. And that would be Dryad Saddle or Pheasant Back. And I have a good feeling about finding this one today. You know, we're approaching mid-May, it's been rainy the past couple of days, and it's been warm as well. And this mushroom really likes all those characteristics. So I'm gonna take a look around, hopefully I'm going to find it, because I wanna to talk to you about this mushroom today. I'll tell you how to properly identify this mushroom. Many of you are probably already familiar with that, but there's some things that you might not be familiar with. For example, some of its medicinal properties, and nutritional benefits as well. And of course, we'll talk about how to properly prepare this mushroom for consumption. So let's take a look around and let's hope that we find Dryad Saddle. So I did find some nice mature specimens of Dryad Saddle right off the bat. It didn't take me too long to find these ones right here. Notice how big these ones are. If this is your first introduction into Dryad Saddle, note to where it's growing, note what it looks like, notice its habitat right here. So it's growing at the base of a dead elm tree. I did look for morel mushrooms because morel mushrooms are oftentimes associated with elm trees. I didn't find any morels, but I did find the Constellation Prize, which is Dryad Saddle. Now I'm going to talk about the specific identification characteristics in a second, whenever we look for the smaller specimens. These are much too big, at least when it comes to eating the whole thing. Yes, you can save some of this for edible properties. You could save the outer margin. You can also dehydrate some of this and throw it into soup stocks. But generally speaking, when you're looking for Dryad Saddle, the ones that you want to harvest entirely for the table, you're looking for the much smaller specimens. So we're going to talk about the identification when we look for the smaller specimens. But if you're already familiar with Dryad Saddle and you're wondering, why in the heck am I watching a video on Dryad Saddle? I already know everything about it. I've been eating it since 1982. Well, maybe you didn't know that you're getting nutrition and medicine directly from your landscape whenever you're consuming Dryad Saddle. And it's true. There's a lot of research on Dryad Saddle, specifically its medicinal properties. So this mushroom has documented antioxidant properties. It has documented immunomodulatory properties. And this is the ability to regulate the immune system. This is what makes medicinal mushrooms so fantastic, is their immunomodulatory properties. This mushroom also has anti-cancer properties. Specifically, there's a lectin that's been isolated from here. And a lectin is a carbohydrate binding protein. And this lectin has been shown to induce apoptosis or apoptosis, which is programmed cellular death or cell suicide. Also, this mushroom has antimicrobial properties. Specifically, it is antibacterial against Staphylococcus aureus. And nutritionally speaking, you're looking at about 60 to 65% carbohydrate, about 13% protein, about 3% fat, and the rest ash and water. So nutrition and medicine directly from your landscape whenever you consume dried saddle. Now I'm going to harvest one of these so that I can compare it to the smaller specimens whenever we find it so you can see the differences between the two. So let me harvest one of these and let's keep looking for the smaller specimens of dried saddle. All right, so look at these nice younger specimens right here. This is typically what I'm looking for when I'm looking for dryad saddle. Smaller ones right here, smaller ones all around the back of here as well. These are always nice to find, but honestly, I'm really looking for these ones when I want to eat dryad saddle. We'll talk about how to properly process them in a couple minutes. So this is on an elm tree. There's an elm stump which is covered, this elm log is covered, and all these elm logs are covered. And that was an elm tree up on the hill where I found this one. So I really see them on elm trees. And you will find them on other hardwood trees as well, like oaks and sometimes ashes and other hardwood trees. I rarely, if ever, see them on conifer trees. In fact, I don't even know if they do grow on conifer trees, but it's not to say that they won't. Just usually you want to look on the hardwood trees for dryad saddle. So what is it doing to this tree? Because I always like to talk about the ecological role of these mushrooms, besides just the edible properties and the medicinal properties. So it's a parasite of living trees. It can invade the inner heartwood of trees and cause the decay of the lignin, also the cellulose and the hemicellulose. So it's a white rot fungus. And white rot fungi are the great lignin degraders in our forest. And it can also act as a saprophyte. So it breaks down dead or decaying organic material, meaning when the tree falls, then it starts to break down the tree as well. So what this means is that you will find them on living trees as a parasite, but you also find them on fallen trees or stumps or logs as saprophytic fungi. So let's look at the names behind this mushroom as well. So we have dryad saddle, we also have pheasant back, we also have hawkswing. Whenever we look at the Latin names, there's at least two out there that are going around. The older one is polyporous squamosis. And that's what you'll usually find in field guides. But the newest currently accepted Latin name is Cereoporus squamosus. So let's look at that because it tells us a lot about the identification of this mushroom. So cer, C-E-R, means honeycomb. And it refers to the pores on the underside because they're honeycomb-shaped pores. That's where polyporus came from. It's a polypore mushroom. There are no gills in the bottom. And there are no teeth either. And it's not completely flat, but it's got pores. And these ones are very easy to see because they're wider and they're honeycomb-shaped. And then squamosis, which is the species name, refers to the scales on this mushroom. You see all these brown scales all over here. That's a key identifying characteristic. Almost always when I find this mushroom, you're seeing scales 
brown scale. It's not completely yellow, it's not completely tan. Look for these brownish scales. So cereopore squamosis, honeycomb pores, and a scaly cap surface. So now that we know a little bit about the name and most of the identification, let's keep going with the identification so that you can properly identify this fungus and not confuse it for anything else. So one thing we didn't talk about yet is its growth cycle. This is an annual fungus. It's not a perennial, so it's not going to put on a new layer year after year, or keep growing year after year. It will grow back in the same spot, but as an annual. So it comes back in the spring months. You'll find it in April, May, and June. Lots of fresh fruiting bodies. And then to a smaller degree throughout the summer months, you'll find it fruiting, and to a smaller degree in the autumn months as well. But generally speaking, in the spring, that's typically the best time to find dryad saddle. We already went over the cap a little bit. We also talked about the pore surface, and these pores do deposit spores that are white. So if you would take a spore print from this mushroom, you would see that it's a white spore print. Also, the stalk of this mushroom can be up to two inches long. Whenever the mushroom is young, the stalk is cream colored, but then it becomes dark with age, and it almost becomes black. And oftentimes you will see the pores, the stretched out honeycomb pores on that stalk because the pore surface extends down into the stalk. Now regarding lookalikes, there aren't any that I know of. This one doesn't really look like any other mushroom out there. If you go through all those characteristics that I described, you could be certain that you do have dryad saddle, cereoporous squamosis, polyporous squamosis, whatever you want to call it. Just go through all those characteristics. This one should be considered one of the foolproof four up there with maitake or lion's mane or morel mushrooms or chicken of the woods. But I don't think a lot of people regard this as the choicest edible mushroom out there so it doesn't get lumped in with all those other ones. But honestly, in my opinion, nothing really looks like this. So this is a very safe mushroom to harvest for the table. So let's talk about some preparation tips for dryad saddle. And one thing that I didn't mention, but one thing you should keep in mind whenever properly identifying this fungus, is to notice the smell of it. So it smells like cucumber or watermelon rind. One of those melons. It smells very good actually. No other mushroom really smells like that and it's one of the things that I look for whenever I'm trying to properly identify dryad saddle, although you shouldn't confuse this for anything else. But if you would get confused, just smell it. Use your nose because the nose knows that it smells like cucumber or watermelon rind. No other mushroom smells like that. Unfortunately, it's not going to impart that flavor into your meals. It's definitely going to impart a mushroomy flavor into your meals or your broth, not cucumber or watermelon. But key things to look for, number one, we mentioned this throughout the video, look for the smallest specimens. But you know, how big is too big? How small should you be looking for? This is what I typically look for. You know, the specimens that look like this, about two inches across in diameter or less, the ones with this really long necks. These are the most tender in my opinion. Once they get to be about this size, you know, the size of a softball or the size of the palm of your hand, you probably can't eat the whole entire thing. It would be like chewing wet cardboard or chewing leather. And so what I do is take a knife and just cut away at this margin right here, about half an inch to an inch in. Then you could chop that up, throw that into a frying pan, you could cook it up and that will be tender. But the rest of the mushroom you could save. You could dehydrate it and throw it into soup stocks. You could powder it and throw it into soup stocks, almost making like a mushroomy broth. You could do it with the older ones as well. You could save some of the outer margin or you could dehydrate it as long as it's a clean specimen, as long as it's not rotten, and you could throw that into soup stocks as well. Regardless of the size or the age, what I like to do is just cut off the stalks, even of the smallest ones. I don't consume the stalks because they're a little too tough and fibrous, but again, you could dehydrate it, throw it in the soup stalks. Another thing people like to do is cut out the pore surface, even in the smaller ones. They don't like to consume the pore surface under here, but I don't mind it. I've eaten it and that's what I've always done, and so you can definitely include the pore surface whenever you're consuming dried saddle. If you don't like it, just take a knife and just scrape away, and you'll just be left with the cap tissue. Also, whenever you're cooking this mushroom, you might want to try to keep it as moist as possible, meaning if you're going to fry it using high heat, a little bit of oil, add some water to that pan as well to keep it moist, because this mushroom tends to get a little too tough the longer you cook it, especially if you use high heat, and it can dry out. But just add some water and so you can prevent it from drying out. And it'll make a delicious meal whenever you mix it with some other things like onions and garlic and add some butter or olive oil, add all those things, add a little bit of water, and you should be good to go with some salt and pepper as well. All right, so we're gonna stop there with dryad saddle, pheasant back, hawkswing, cereal pore squamosis, polypora squamosis, whatever you wanna call it. If you wanna make up a new name for this mushroom, I encourage you to do so. Nobody's gonna stop you, not even me. I encourage you to get out there and look for this mushroom and harvest it, especially if you've never seen this mushroom before. And if you have, perhaps you have gained a newer appreciation for not only its nutritional properties, but its medicinal properties as well. Thanks so much for watching this video. As always, I encourage you to subscribe to the Learn Your Land YouTube channel. You can also head on over to learnyourland.com, sign up for the email newsletter so that we can stay in touch. 
And also we can stay in touch on social media at Learn Your Land if you use those kinds of things. Thanks again, happy mushroom hunting, and I'll see you on the next video.